a clean edit. Um, so welcome to our session about environmental art as activism with uh, BT Wolf, a wonderfully creative artist, um, as you will soon see. My name is Carsten Mem. I'm a business and technology writer here in Berlin. Thank you so much for coming out to the uh, venue here, this wonderful auditorium at the Natural History Museum, Natural Science Museum, I'm sorry. Um, BT, unfortunately, um, cannot join us this morning here in person. We will hear from her in a moment why that is the case. Um, the session is all about her art, her uh, incredible boundless creativity, um, and how she kind of uses this to make science and scientific insights, particularly into climate change and, and sustainability, more accessible to everybody. So BT, uh, originally from Britain, but now she lives in Los Angeles. Uh, it's fairly early in the morning. Good morning, BT, how are you this morning? Hey, Carsten. Yeah, I'm good. And it's wonderful to be here in this virtual capacity. Um, you know, a as you mentioned, I sadly can't be there physically because I'm really choosing to limit my flying at the moment, um, given all the environmental work. And so I've become pretty much like uh, based in LA as much as possible. So. I can hear my, myself in the background, um, which I guess is, um, let, me, let me try one thing. Hang on one sec. So this is the beauty of modern technology. <laughs> Everybody has to tweak a little bit to make it work, but it's still amazing that, that we can better. see you um, um, and that this second. is working, Sorry that you're able to join us this way. And I absolutely adore your studio, I have to say. This uh, no, with the, all I was the getting a real echo. Can you put and, it? And on by the, the way, what you're seeing in the background already um, shows you that BT is not just a digital person, even though she does incredible work with um, interactivity and technology, but she also loves all things analog and haptic, and we'll talk about this, um, because you see all the actual vinyl and CDs in the background there. So, and I, see yes. the, and I see the mug for the morning coffee. I hope you at least got a chance to enjoy this. Then let us know, please, if this works for you. Yeah, I, th I think so. Let me just try speaking a bit. That seems to be better. Um, I, was I was just getting very loud echo, which made me feel like I was stuck inside my head, which, you know, I... I am in many ways. So yeah, that's a lot better. So um, yeah, sadly, I am, I'm beaming in today because um, as I mentioned, you know, the, the environmental work which we're gonna be talking more about is such a big focus for me right now. And it has been really since I saw An Inconvenient Truth as a teenager um, in the cinema. And so just becoming more conscious of flying because I feel like it's all the, little actions that we take that we think maybe are inconsequential that are actually what it's about. It's these micro decisions that we're all gonna have to start being more um, really conscious about. So um, I wish I could be there because the theater looks so beautiful and chatting with you, Carsten, in, in person is always such a pleasure um, and to be you know, with the audience, but it's, it's lovely to have this option available to us. Well, again, we're glad that um, technology makes it possible to have you here. Um, you, of course, tomorrow we, we, we were sort of here assembled talking a day before COP27 begins. Last year you were at COP26 uh, in Glasgow presenting um, your From Green to Red project. Before we show a little clip, um, tell us please kind of in a nutshell what this is about and what we are about to see in that in that video. Absolutely. So in a nutshell, From Green to Red is a environmental protest art piece taking 800,000 years of 
um, atmospheric CO2 data and weaving it into this dynamic interactive timeline of the planet, depicting rising CO2 levels and human impact. And it's set, the visualization is set to a song I wrote as a teenager after seeing An Inconvenient Truth, a track called From Green to Red, which is also now the name of the project, and I'll you know, talk more about how that all came to be. Um, but the intention behind the piece was really to take data, huge amounts of data that often for people is you know, really hard to absorb and hard to get a sense of and turn it into something that everyone could see, everyone could relate to, and uh, you know, almost speeding up 800,000 years into four minutes, you know, this four minute song visualization so that we can see where we are on the planet right now. Very good. Then I would like to ask the tech team to please um, show us that video. Then we all know um, what you just described. We can see it. And afterwards, we're going to talk a little bit about how you actually turned this into an interactive art piece um, in, in London as well. Outside the people like cars are still running When inside it's safe to deny that it's coming The TV's turned up so the winds are just humming to the sound of the heat rising. We don't want to hear that the problem is us. So we live like we want in our own universe. Cause man thinks he's God in a devilish way. We're too proud to see what we won't even say. We don't want to know, don't want to know, don't want to know, don't want to know. No, we don't want to know, don't want to know, don't want to know, don't want to know. So take my hand, babe, and I'll walk you to school, where you'll learn how to live by a new set of rules. Cause we played all our cards, but none left for you. Forgive us, my dear, can't you see? It's the truth that we don't want to know, don't want to know, don't want to know, don't want to know. No, we don't want to know, don't want to know, don't want to know, don't want to know. What happened to love? Is it out of date? Turn back, turn back, there's so much here to say. To love, is it out of date? Turn back, turn back, don't live like it's too late. The creatures don't know for what cause they have died. So we wipe off our hands on the fur and the hide. We sit at the top with our great peace of mind. We don't want to know, don't want to know, don't want to know, don't want to know. No, we don't want to know, don't want to know, don't want to know, don't want to know. So remember, denial is a haunt of the head. Let your eyes and your heart guide your reason instead. When the hungry are starved, the full are still fed. We sit at the crossroads, the green turns to red. But we don't want to know, don't want to know, don't want to know, don't want to know. No, we don't want to know, don't want to know, don't want to know, don't want to know. What happened to love? Is it out of date? Turn back, turn back, don't live like it's too late. What happened to love? Is it out of date? 
turn back There's so much here to say What happened to love? Is it out of date? Turn back, turn back Don't live like it's too late What happened to love? Is it out of date? Turn back, turn back There's so much here to say Turn back Beautiful, thank you very much. Um, we all saw kind of this, the green fabric-like structures float by turning into red. Obviously that gave the uh, artwork its name. Explain a little bit to us, please, what we just saw. I mean, it's obvious that this refers to um, the, the carbon emissions and the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, but um, how did you visualize it? You said it's based on 800,000 um, years of, of NASA climate data. W how did you create this kind of visual sculpture out of it? And, and um, what, uh, well, you know, what is it supposed to, um, to show? <laughs> yeah, Carsten, well, so, um, yeah, what you saw was uh, 800,000 years of NASA NOAA climate data looking at the um, CO atmospheric CO2 levels. And really, it's quite simple. It's not some um, incredibly clever code or in terms of the visualization. It's really like a reimagined graph. Um, so it's sort of like taking an existing graph and demonstrating it showing it in a different fashion. Um, I worked, you know, with this special effects company that lost our audio. No. This woven timeline, you know, this kind of planetary timeline where by as the CO2 levels started to rise, you know, the threads, everything about the, the fabric, the um, visualized fabric, was getting chaotic and the, the colors were changing, the threads were getting pulled apart. So um, it was really pretty simple in terms of just putting in those data points and the, you know, both in terms of the planetary date and the um, carbon PPM, and then really allowing the game engine to generate something until it was like visually what I could see in my mind. Um, I think the thing that's really interesting, which you guys don't get to experience in this version, is the interactive installation, which was at the London Design Biennale. So the, almost the main version of the project is this interactive version, where you can move your hands over the fabric as it's being woven in front of you, and you can pull out the specific carbon PPM and the date, and I feel that really gives people a sense of being able to interrogate, um, you know, those different points and where things, where, where we start to really screw things up uh, in a way. And at COP26, you know, because COP27 is now happening, I was actually meant to be there as well. Um, but I, I, I felt, well, along with the decision to really limit flying, I also felt that this one was much more administrative. Last year, was it felt as if all the world, uh, eyes of the world for the first time, in a way, were on COP, um, in a way that they hadn't been in the previous years. And it felt like there was really the potential for positive action to follow the conference. Um, and I was doing an installation of the project at the New York Times Climate Hub a projection onto the conference center, you know, which was this 500 foot, uh, 550 feet across um, structure and, you know, a number of other things. And it, yeah, it really felt as if like, oh my God, maybe, maybe this is it. Maybe this is the time we're going to wake up and start actually doing something. And so I won't comment on where I feel we are with that today, but um, yeah, it was definitely wonderful to see the project um, part of that conference in, in such a big way. So you mentioned um, on another occasion, you mentioned that um, you wrote the song 
you told us when you were 16, but you also said um, you never expected to actually have to perform it in some way because after Al Gore's documentary, um, people would wake up and do something. Why, why do you think so little has happened? You mentioned also that all of us have our own part to play. Obviously, it makes a difference whether we're driving four billion uh, you know, combustion <coughs> engine cars or more cleaner cars, for example, or how we heat, etc. cetera. Um, so why, why do you think um, we as humans are showing such a laid back attitude to a more and more pressing project, uh, uh, problem? I think because, well, I mean, that's quite a big question, Carsten. <laughs> I feel like technology, ironically, because, uh, as in I, I say it, So now, ironically, we have lost, thanks to technology, our feed, our sound feeds, no, I don't know. It's a magic feeling or a different dimension or a new way of s seeing or experiencing. Can you hear me? Uh, sorry for interrupting you because we lost the audio feed here in the, in the auditorium for a moment. Exactly when you said ironically technology. Okay. <laughs> Tell us again, please. Thank you. Okay. So, um, uh, firstly, yeah, big question. And I would say that for me, you know, technology has, in addition to doing many wonderful things for us as human beings, and the reason I said ironically is because I'm criticizing technology when I also do utilize it in a lot of the projects to create these new ways of experiencing, seeing music and art and kind of opening up these other worlds. But I feel like technology has fast-tracked what a lot, a lot of what it means to be a human being on this planet without reflecting the costs in the fast-tracking pro process and shortchanging us in many ways. So suddenly we have all this access, but we don't really have any value. We have all this noise, but we don't have curation. And I think our relationship, human beings' relationship with the natural world and with art in terms of really what art does to us on a core fundamental human being level, um, I think technology has disrupted those two core relationships. So I feel a, a lot of it is because as we've innovated, we haven't factored in the cost Okay, and there's an audio hole once again. Sorry about that. I we don't live know. now, and we're talking about the, um, you know, privileged part of the world, but we live in a way that is just, you know, honestly not s sustainable and hasn't been for a very long time. So um, we have unfortunately some some audio issues, um, but um, it's. So it's the internet I hear. We can see you, but we can't always hear you, unfortunately. I don't know how that can be explained. Um, maybe it's the, the Zoom engineers that could tell us. Um, but do you, you said that technology kind of has uh, made us lose touch with certain things, um, with nature, with, with um, the haptic world. You, of course, you've tried with many of your projects to bring them together. Explain, please, a couple of things that you've done. Uh, I don't want to do it. I'd rather you do it. Um, so tell us, please, uh, how you try to, to bridge the analog and the digital. Okay, and hopefully the audio Fingers is crossed. working now. Yeah, I'm going to speak. I'll speak slowly. This is making everyone slow down. Um, and just in case the sentiment didn't come across in what I was saying before, I think the issue is that technology fast-tracked a lot of things but didn't reflect the costs in that fast-tracking process. So that's really why we don't have a sense of um, the costs of 
you know, us having whatever we want, whenever we want, talking. There we go. Sorry, BD. Um, you... So in terms of your other question, the, the, the thing I'm interested in is how you take the best of the old world and the best of the new world. And you find that bridge between the physical and the digital where you know, you're still bringing in the ceremony, the tangibility, the storytelling that we had in the, say, physical music listening world, but also not just music, every medium, you know, journalism, art, poetry, literature, um, you know, all of these new digital forms, I think, have lost something in a lot of ways. So I like to think about how you can create these deeper, tangible ceremonial mu moments around music, art, and these other worlds in the digital space. Um, and so two examples of those. One was a anti-stream from the quietest room on earth. So it was the, actually the world's first live 360 AR stream. So very technological, but it was all set up via a record player, a physical record player, that was playing in the original anechoic chamber, the space where Helen Keller experienced silence for the first time, as this anti-stream in the streaming age. So you had the album playing on repeat physically 24 hours um, for a week. And you know, as you were listening in this beautiful ceremonial space, um, where they discovered rogue frequencies and psychoacoustics. Uh, this really amazing audio room where also you can hear the blood rushing through your veins. It's, it's the, this very eerie experience. Um, the lyrics and the artwork would be streaming out of the vinyl and surrounding you in this chamber and taking you into the visual landscape of each song as it was playing in real time as this sort of Fantasia experience for the album in the digital age. And really, to me, that was the equivalent of being seven years old um, as, a, you know, as a kid and opening up Abbey Road and feeling like Abbey Road just came to life, or whatever the record was, it came to life around me. Um, so that was really a, an embodiment of me trying to create a version of that, but for where we are today. You said you had another second project or you that you wanted to <laughs> describe? Yeah, I ha there are, for sure. Um, yeah, there are, there are many projects, um, but I'd say the, the second one, which you mentioned, haptic, you mentioned tangible, um, and that it also has a nice, um, very nice story in terms of it was a reimagining of the album jacket, uh, thinking about the album jacket originally as this art form, which we lost as well, really, when we moved from physical to digital. And so I wanted to think about that in a different way. Um, but it happened very organic. Zoom silenced you again, I'm afraid. And Yoko and Ringo and Hendrix, all of these amazing musicians had li lived with the tailor who dressed a lot of those musicians, um, a tailor called Mr. Fish. And um, I, I Am I still with you? <laughs> now, now you're back. You were, you were, unfortunately, the sound dropped for a moment. But you were, I'll, I'll briefly explain this for the audience here. You were talking about, about talking to us about this jacket that you made, that basically had some chips inside, so that people could, with an NFC chip or or a reader, could kind of, or their smartphones could play the song embedded in the actual fabric of the actual jacket. So how, how on earth, um, how does a, 
a musician, uh, I could see many musicians come up with this idea probably, um, but how do, you, how do you turn that into a reality? Do you, have you always had a proclivity uh, to technology, even as a child, and then you're maybe a little engineer inside as well as an artist? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I mean, um, for me, I never saw all of these, all of the fields and the disciplines as being really disconnected from one another. I think I felt like whatever your creativity or wh wherever your imagination, creativity, curiosity took you, that was what you should follow. And growing up, you know, I definitely had as much of a love in a way for ecology and philosophy and, you know, all these other fields as I did music and art. And I never wanted to limit, you know, myself to just being in one lane or one avenue. Um, with the musical jacket, you mentioned, yeah, you could tap your phone onto the fabric to hear the music that was woven into it. But for me, the really cool thing was r more the concept. You know, it was um, cut by this tailor who dressed Bowie, Hendrix, Jagger out of this fabric, which actually had the, the waveforms kind of woven into the fabric so you could see the music. You could literally see the music that was woven into it. And the music was recorded in the room where McCartney wrote Eleanor Rigby, where Hendrix wrote The Wing Prize Mary. All these songs had been written. And so I love this idea of capturing the resonance and the history of this space, this amazing space, and translating that into something that you could visualize and you could see. And it was also really a celebration of the album jacket of you know the vinyl days that we had kind of lost. Um, and so for me, that was the, the story of it was the part that really, you know, really I loved. And then the, the technology part was like a little twist, you know. Very good. Do you, do you have one other standout project that I think we should take a quick look at, which is Raw Space? Um, and maybe you could briefly tell us what we're going to see in the next video um, and then we can talk about it before we, we roll it. Cool. So I mentioned this anti-stream from the quietest room on earth and that was with Bell. Bel okay, Zoom is dropping out on you, unfortunately. It's dropping you, the sound. And with Robert Rauschenberg and John Cage and Andy Warhol, all these amazing artists doing experiments with engineers. So I was rebooting this historic program 50 years on with that anti-stream experience. And this was the second chapter to that story. Um, so this was where me and Nobel Laura, uh, laureate Robert Wilson who discovered cosmic microwave radiation using the Homdel horn antenna, he and I did a space broadcast of the record through this historic antenna. Very good. And then I'd like to ask the team to please show us that second video of raw space. The place, a hilltop in New Jersey. The setting, giant antennas like monstrous eyes and ears, straining, watching, waiting. And now, 50 years on, this historic horn will be used for the first time to beam music into space. My latest record, Raw Space. Should we do it together? One, two, three. So here we are, we're in front of the Homdil horn antenna, um, which was used to prove the validity of the Big Bang Theory. Won the scientist a Nobel Prize. What's so exciting about raw space is not only will we be creating the first fully augmented reality 360 album stream, but we'll also be the first to beam an album into space 
via this horn antenna. Today they are looking, as all humanity looks, to the vast potentials of outer space. <laughs> At first, I was perplexed how to do something like this, but as I thought about it, I started having ideas. We all know radio. If we could modulate the sound on a microwave carrier, it could go through the horn and go up into space. So what do we have here? It's a fancy radio that shows what we're transmitting. And if you look at the screen, there's this big spike, and that's the radio signal that's carrying your music. Oh, we can listen. Here we are, one, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> and so when we turn the antenna up, that signal will be the one heading up into space. Okay, well, should we do that now? Yes. Yes. Do it. <laughs> You know, it's amazing how when things are made well, they last. <laughs> Just like music, folks. So this is the end of the horn where we can connect to either a signal source or a receiver. Right now, we have a radiator in there that can radiate microwaves and a speaker, which can broadcast sound. It comes out of this horn up to the surface up there, which is a piece of a paraboloid, sort of like a little piece of the reflector of your flashlight or something. Then it makes it into a signal that's going pretty much in one direction into space. Well, maybe at this hour, it will go past the planet Venus on its way out of the solar system. I love creating worlds for each of my albums and sending this one into space makes it truly universal. Well, I guess it's time to start the broadcast. Okay. <laughs> Should we do it together? One, two, two three. three. Hello, this is BT Walk, and this is the Raw Space. Yeah. <laughs> broadcast coming to you from the rawest recording space on the planet and uh, transmitting into the rawest space outside the planet. Wonderful. Yes, please. Clap. So, clearly I'm not the only fan of this. Um, your, your music is traveling further and further into space now, and has been since that project was launched. Do, do you have any idea how far your songs have traveled yet? The last time I checked, which was like three years ago, um, the music, apparently, according to one of the engineers, was halfway on its way to, um, I think it was uh, Proxima Centauri. <laughs> so that was, yeah, that was the last update I had. This is sort of a bit of a speculative question, I guess. Do you, do you are you convinced that there are other beings out there that may one day be able to hear the music, enjoy the music? Yeah, interesting, um, Carsten. I mean, I, look, I feel like human being knowledge is so basic compared to even nature, you know, nature's technology and intelligence and creativity is way greater than our own. So for us to be the only beings floating around in space, I, yeah, I, I, I think that's doubtful. Um, a number of friends and astronomers and, you know, some of the people I've worked with would send articles. There have been more and more articles saying, oh, strange signal received from, you know, unknown source and way out there. <laughs> and um, so, it, and we sent that as a radio signal. So we actually sent the music as a radio signal so that it could get past the Earth's atmosphere and get all the way out there. Um, and it was, it was wonderful. It doesn't show it in the video, but the first time I met Robert Wilson, we were in front of that horn antenna, and I said, 
you've used this instrument to receive, but have you ever used it to transmit? And he's like, well, no. You know, also because once you've won a Nobel Prize for a discovery um, with this instrument, you know, you, it's almost like you've checked that box. So I said, well, I have this record called Raw Space, and it was called Raw Space based on this anechoic chamber, nothing to do with space. But in theory, could we do this you know, broadcast? Could we send it out into space? And he said, no, because the music will get to a point in the Earth's atmosphere and then stop. And I thought that was the end of the conversation. And a month later, I get an email from him saying, you know, BT, I figured it out. I can do an update on the horn antenna and we can do this broadcast. And this is a national historic landmark. This is a serious instrument. So the whole thing was amazing and magical and and. Let's hope for the best. Because I, I discovered that that horn antenna had been first used by JPL, NASA, to send a phone call via space, which was being bounced off a Mylar balloon and received at Bell Labs at the horn antenna. And so I ended up then giving a talk at NASA's JPL about my work and showing this video and that was after that talk, one of the chief engineers comes up and shows me these atmospheric CO2 graphs. And that was how From Green to Red came to be, you know. So we had a bit of an audio issue again, but basically these two projects are connected. Raw space, because of your presentation at JPL, led to From Green to Red. Yes, correct. Okay, very good. You are involved in another very intriguing, to me, intriguing project, which is kind of a musical, you called it Seed Bank, in Norway, in Spitsbergen. Um, and tell us a little bit, please, about what's behind that, what the idea behind it is, because I think that's yet again connected to a basic idea of From Green to Red. Yes, and I not knowing what you're here, you know, it's almost like a haiku, <laughs> or it's like a new way of communicating what actually comes through. Um, so this year, I was asked to be part of the first music seed bank, essentially. And the idea is like the seed bank, to take music that is culturally significant and preserve it for the long term, so that in the worst case scenario, uh, which it looks like human beings may be headed towards, we potentially have, you know, like a, a time capsule or a way of restoring um, music and culture to the planet, as well as, you know, the, the ve vegetation and the plantation. So my music, along with the International Library of African Music, um, mu music and work from the uh, Poland Music Prize and a number of other big um, culturally significant collections was encoded in glass by Microsoft Research um, to be preserved in this vault in Svalbard for 10,000 years. And this is the first time that data has been stored in glass in this way that is, it's hugely exciting because you can store vast amount of data, um, cold, you know, in terms of not using any energy until you need it in this very durable way, which is storing it in glass. And so even that alone um, opens up huge questions around, you know, energy and storage capacities and taking a lot of things off servers. Um, so, yeah, it's a really exciting project. It's called the Global Music Vault. Um, a geek question, namely how, um, you know, let's hope that the worst doesn't happen. Um, we simply want to access the data even 100 years from now. How do we do this? Because if I, if I take an example from my university years, which are 
couple of decades back, more than a couple. Uh, my master's thesis is stored on a floppy disk, and of course these days there's no computer that can out of the box access a floppy disk anymore. What's the idea behind this? How do you how do you get to that data if you ever want to again? So I lost you, Carsten, for the second part of that question, but I got the first bit, which is how do we access it in the future? Um, it's actually via a microscope. You use, you'd use a microscope. Okay, let's hope that um, that's clear to everybody who wants to access it 100 years from now or 1,000 years from now. Um, <laughs> you, th this, this, theme of sustainability is a recurring one in your work. Tell us a little bit, please. You already mentioned that as a child growing up, you felt connected to nature. Where does that come from? I think we're all connected with nature. I think it's something we innately have as human beings. And it's almost that we disconnect ourselves from nature, um, you know, because of the human ego, because of material, you know, all the things that we think we need or that society teaches us that are important. And I feel like the natural world is, um, it's, you know, it's our greatest teacher. It's our greatest inspiration. It's where the best art and creativity and, and as I said, technology you know, we think that we can invent all this incredible technology. Just look at nature's regenerative powers when we l let Mother Nature regenerate. It's incredible. So I, I feel like we all have it. I think I, yeah, I definitely had it. I definitely felt it from when I was... So whether it was a bug or you know, any kind of an insect, really, I just, uh, I, I would try and protect all the insects, you know. I'd take sna snails to school in my pocket. <laughs> I was pretty, pretty obsessed um, with, I guess, all creatures, great and small. And, you know, I've always been vegan and things like that. So, um, yeah, I guess I feel like that very anthropomorphic view of the planet and the hierarchy, I think human beings are actually much more basic than we think. And I think there's an intelligence in the natural world, both in um, the animal kingdom, but also the plant and the fungi kingdom that we're only just beginning to wake up to. So I guess the, the crucial question would be, you may have felt this natural closeness to all the things that you described, but how do we get people who do not feel like that to relate to nature more and um, maybe move towards a circular economy, find an interest in these things, uh, et cetera? Any, how can art help that? What art, how can art make a difference? It's interesting you ask that because I've been working on this eco-documentary, um, looking at these initiatives, these environmental circular economy initiatives that are hidden in plain sight, in a way, in California. One is um, with NOAA, who are rewilding the abalone population of the West Coast, that in the last 10 or 15 years has gone down to 10% of what it was. And the other one is this urban wood project, rethinking the cityscape and really planting the right trees in the right environments, which then at the end of life cycle, that wood, instead of being mulch or tinder, where all the carbon is released back into the atmosphere, is it's becoming a guitar. And so the carbon is being stored in those um, guitars, buildings, whatever, you know, it, whatever we're making. And the, the central point of these um, documentaries 
is the guitar. It's the guitar that I play on because it's the materials that the guitar is made out of that point to these various initiatives. Um, and I think we have like a very short teaser video of part of this. We do. Before we play that, um, I'm curious, is one of the guitars behind you the one that you talked about made out of this kind of wood? Yeah. <laughs> does, it, does it sound any different to you or, or is it just like a regular guitar but you know it, it sort of does something good for the planet as well? So it's made by Taylor Guitars. Taylor Guitars I've been doing a lot of work with um, because of their sustainability focus and because they are very instrumental using a music pun <laughs> in creating these new circular economies and turning what was previously waste materials into something of value. say that there's a big difference between that type of wood and rosewood or mahogany. But I think that sounds as good as any other wood. And, you know, this is also where I think human beings have to adjust. We have to go with what's the sustainable option, not what our preference is. Um, thank you for that. Um, then I would like to watch with you that that third video, which is actually about um, the the kelp uh, forests that you mentioned, which is a kind of algae. Um, if we can play video number three, please. So we're here at the cultured abalone farm in Galita. What we have in front of us right here are a lot of red abalone, which typically then get sold at market. But there's also this amazing initiative to rewild and replant and regrow a lot of the white abalone from babies and then you know, plant them off the coast of California as part of this NOAA initiative to really restore that population that became obviously hugely decimated with the loss of the sea kelp forest and the warming waters and other contributing factors. So yeah, this place is pretty amazing because obviously it's both operating on a sort of commercial level but also as this restoration facility for this greater ecological initiative. The thing I find fascinating is just how this species that is you know, very iconic for Californians, so actually people really do notice when it's no longer in the oceans, is really indicative of just so many species that we're losing or in danger of losing that we just don't notice because it's sort of hidden in plain sight. And the abalone is not hidden in plain sight and so the fact that we're noticing that, you know, makes us think, well, what are we not noticing? So it's a great architect of the sea kelp forest. It's kind of like the otter in that respect. And it really is a sign of the ocean's health overall and health of those habitats. So not just a snail. My name is Mona Olivas Tucker, and I'm the tribal chair for Yaktichi Ticha Yaktahini. Northern Chumash Tribe of San Luis Obispo County and Region. And our membership is comprised of people whose ancestry dates back to this one, one area for well over 12,000 years. That's been our homeland, it's our ancestral homelands. It's part of who we are and it's in our DNA. Not only was it a loss of a traditional food source for tribal people, it was a loss of a food source for a lot of people. But if the ocean's not healthy, neither are we. So, you know, take care of the things around you is the same thing as taking care of yourself. So even if it doesn't uh, appear to impact you directly, it does impact you directly. And if you want to survive and you want to be healthy and you want your family to be healthy and your kids, grandkids, great grandkids, otherwise, what are you doing? Are you just burning down the house? You know, to quote an old song is, and what do you have then for your children to live in? Nothing, you know, just rubble. We want to do better than that. I mean, we all do. This isn't an argument, really. I mean, this is, this is just a statement. We all should want the same thing. Are you planning to do more? Are you planning to produce more of these um, sort of little clips? Or is it 
you said documentary. Is it part of a larger documentary? What's the next step with that? Unfortunately, we can't hear you right now. I could tell these stories. It may not have been as obvious what the connection is with abalone, but actually the abalone shell would typically be used for guitar inlay. So like this would all be um, abalone shell. So that's the connection with this initiative. That's you know how those two connect. And um, yeah, a bigger documentary is being made at the moment, which is looking at you know everything from the sea to the trees that we're planting. Um. Is, is all of the, you just showed us, unfortunately, again, we had a bit of an audio problem, but you just showed us, showed us how um, even the abalone kind of ties in just like the, the recycled wood does with your work with, with the guitar. Um, is that kind of the common thread of what you're planning? Yes, yes. So the guitar is the vehicle to tell these stories. Like the materials that the guitar is made out of are where we go and look at these, these eco-circular economy initiatives. You have one uh, very recent project in terms of circular economy, which I found intriguing as well, uh, along with Michael Skype, the singer of R.E.M. You produced a very special kind of, not quite vinyl record, Yeah, so it was the world's first bioplastic, so non-PVC record that has been commercially released. And it was me and Michael Stipe um, doing new music uh, in aid of Brian Eno's environmental charity. So all of the proceeds went to Brian Eno's charity, Earth Percent. And yeah, it's, it was an amazing, um, there was an amazing response to it. It really opens up like the data storage, you know, like this, uh, this new way of storing huge amounts of data. This bioplastic record also opens up the door for how we can start doing things without the costs we've made to the planet that previously just kind of went unnoticed really, you know. It, it brings up the question, of course, if it's biodegradable, how many times can I play it before it disintegrates? It's, it almost feels like the opposite of the Spitzbergen project, which is for eternity, and this shows us the fragi fragi fragility. Sorry. Absolutely. But I'd say also with regular vinyl, you can only play it so many times before it also sounds impaired. You know, so in a way, this behaves exactly like typical vinyl, but it's just all, you know, sugars, starches, like the material is, you know, all bioplastic, as I mentioned, and also the methods of production are, you know, very different in terms of energy usage and materials being used and things like that. Since you are always at the vanguard of technology. Let me pick your brain about two big trends in uh, technology and, and they're intersecting with art. One is, of course, um, artificial intelligence. Do you think that artificial intelligence, we see it now producing uh, pieces of art, music, they can play like Beethoven, for example, compose like Beethoven, supposedly. Um, do you see artificial intelligence technology as being able to be actually creative? So I lost part of that question, but I get the sense of what you're asking. Um, I think a version of AI in the creation of art has always existed or has existed for a long time in some capacity even going back to Top of the Pops, the early charts, you know, things like that. And then, of course, yeah, with, the, with algorithms and then now with AI, 
um, AI-generated art. M my feeling is that um, it's very good at imitating. It's not good at creating. So it might be able to imitate you know, a, a work of Beethoven almost perfectly, but to actually come up with the ingenuity to form the original creation and and the, that I feel is where AI falls short and will always fall short because it's about intention. You know, human beings have an intention which they bring to everything. It's this energy that governs the creation. And if you don't have intention, which, you know, um, computers sadly don't, then it's a very different feeling. It feels like something that is surfacely, on the surface, it's very beautiful, or it's quite, you know, convincing or impressive, but it doesn't have that depth and that breadth to it. And also because it's the human imperfection, it's the things that we would never program. It's the weird voice of Leonard Cohen, or it's, you know, the, the unus unusual, you know, spacing of Matisse or whatever it is. It's these things that are, would be seemingly a mistake. It's almost in the mistakes. That's where art moves us in those, you know, mistakes in those imperfect human being moments. So I feel that AI should be used for things that human beings aren't good at. And there's a lot of stuff we're not good at, but the creation of art is something we're very good at. Before I come to the other tech trend, uh, this brings up the question of how you work personally. How do you iterate, how do you sort of find your own voice in your music, but also with your projects? How many attempts does it take, for example, for a typical project? I assume you don't immediately know exactly what the turnout will be. What do you mean by turnout? Sorry, but what the result will be, I should have said. Okay. Um, it goes back to something esoteric, you know, which art and nature point to all the time, this mystery, this big mystery. And I think the best art, you know, very much conjures up that feeling of something you can't put into words, something spiritual, something that takes you to another dimension. And for me, that's where the ideas come from. It never feels like, <clears throat> excuse me, it never feels like my idea And that's very much, you know, my experience of it, where um, it's almost like you see it in your mind's eye, you have a vision for something, and then you just have to facilitate that vision. And you are really just the custodian of the idea. It's not, there's no ownership or ego about it, but you just have to keep the project on track for it to be realized the way it's meant to be realized. And, and then you just let it off in the world and see what it does. That's how I feel. Very good. The um, ownership is an interesting uh, uh, word here because that, of course, is the other trend that I, that I want to ask you about is NFTs. Can, have you experimented with this? This for, for people who are not so into tech is of course the, the big trend um, where artists sell kind of digital certificates um, that are on the blockchain and supposedly also live forever. They can be traded, they, can, uh, they cost money, they can supposedly make a lot more money in the future. It's kind of almost like a speculative speculative art object. Um, what is your position on NFTs and can people maybe buy some BT music, BT Wolf music uh, as an NFT? Hell no. <laughs> no, 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 no interest. <laughs> zero, zero interest. But, but why? Um, 
it's actually because I feel like I talked about my view of what's interesting, in my opinion, is figuring out what the best of the physical old, let's call it the old world, and the best of the new world is, and how you can take the best of the old, the best of the new, create something totally different, but that has these elements. You know, it has the tangible, the ceremonial, the um, story of the physical world, but it has the magic and the immediacy and the excitement of the digital world. And to me, NFTs are taking the worst of the old world and the worst of the new world. So for me, that's something I have no interest in um, because you're, it's not tangible, it's not ceremonial, there's no story to it, and you're using you know, the, the digital aspect um, in the way that to me is the most dull and superficial and uninspiring. So to have that alone is one factor, but then to consider the energy usage, the fact that these you know, disused power plants are opening, reopening because of cryptocurrency, yeah, I mean, if there was a really good reason to do it and there was an energy cost, then maybe. But for me, there's no good reason to be doing it in the first place. There's no why. There's no intention. And if you ask most people why you know, they're excited about NFTs or potentials of cryptocurrency, it's all the speculative potential. It's not anything that is currently working. And, you know, I think that news item recently, people have now seen through it, you know. Thank you. I almost feel there's a rhythm to the audio glitches because it, it kinked out at the end on us again, unfortunately. But I think your main message came across before um, we sort of uh, go to the finish line with looking at your next project. Um, if anybody here has a question, please just raise your hand. We have a microphone um, and, and we'll be happy to bring you in. Um, so let me ask you, uh, are you, are you planning as your next project? Is it going to be tied in with sustainability again? What are you planning next? So the next project is essentially um, a way of taking people inside the artist's brain. So to me, it, it's really interesting that we all have like these multiple streams going on in our brain all the time. You know, there's probably a music stream and a, a philosophy stream and a memory stream and a visual stream. I mean, yes, there's, there are literally the different parts of the brain and what they do, what they function as. But also we have, I feel like, this radio in our heads all the time that's going between these different channels. And so the next inst installation will be at the London Design Biennale next year, 20... ...to hear all these different streams and channels and consciousness. Um, and the way people will be able to do that is via this thinking cap, uh, which will have the different audio channels encoded in the, in the capacity I mentioned with micro Microsoft Research um, in this fashion that's very long-term, durable, energy efficient. So it will both be sustainable and also a bit like the musical jacket, like creating a hat version of the musical jacket. For, for those who can't be in London next year, 
um, and be in this musical sculpture, so to speak, experience it by themselves. Um, describe a little bit, please, what is it? You said it's like going into the musician's head. Um, how many voices are there right now? What are they saying? One voice seems to be saying, why not is behind anything I do. Um, most people ask why, it's you say why not. Well, Carsten, <laughs> I say, I think the two, you got to have why and you got to have why not simultaneously. So you've got to understand why you're doing something. I'd almost say the why is the most important. That is the core intention. But then you also have to have, well, why not? Why wouldn't I do this? You know, why wouldn't I send my music into space or, you know, create an album as a deck of cards or like whatever it is. So I think it's the paradox and almost also talking about Sorry about that. You know, we really can have that paradox existing in our work and we know that the truth is actually within the paradox. So it's not one thing or the other, it's the tension between those two things. Uh, sorry for interrupting you, but unfortunately the, the Zoom tension got in between you and us when you were explaining the paradox. If you could just recap that briefly for us, please, thank you. Yeah, so I, I was just saying that it's as much the why as it is the why not. And for me, why is the most important, but why not also has to be there as well. And when we are smart, when we're intelligent as human beings, um, I think one of the good examples of that is that we can hold these paradoxes alive in our work, in our understanding, in what we do. And it's not that it's one or the other, it's the tension between those two things, that's where the truth is, that's where the magic is. Well, now you're basically going into quantum mechanics, um, and which <laughs> makes me wonder, are there any technologies that you see on the horizon that you would like to experiment with, like, for example, a quantum computer? What would you do with <laughs> a quantum computer? I, you know, the tech... <laughs> the... Um, the technology is always the last part of the puzzle in a way for me, in the sense I never think, oh, I have to now do something with AR or NFC, not NFT. Uh, vision. And technology is often a component that can help open that up or facilitate that. But I never lead with the technology. It never starts with the technology. That is almost the, the last, like, magic dust or something. That's nicely explained, even though, once again, Zoom wanted to turn us into lip readers, um, I'm afraid. Um, so if... If I don't see any... I wish, I, there's, I, wish there's, I knew Braille. There, I, I apologize. Uh, there is one question from the audience. So please, if we can get a microphone to the gentleman, please, then um, I have one more to wrap it up, unless we have more questions. Bitte, my name is Eugen Oetringer. I've participated in about 20 initiatives, several about sustainable development goals, and I'm afraid only two are still going on. All others get either stuck in the system or reduce their ambitions to marginal. And from those experiences, we, ex we identified uh, one of the major roadblocks. And when you mentioned uh, to get streams in our, into our heads, that sounded really interesting in that respect, because uh, what we discovered is that uh, there are the laws of nature coming from physics, engineering, mathematics. And we asked whether they apply in management disciplines, in social sciences, and also for this 
uh, for the sustainable development goals, and 50% of the respondents answered yes. And then came the big surprise. A scientist from the field of social scientists said, uh, yes, we know they are important, but we don't know how to apply them in the field of social scientists, of social sciences. And another scientist answered, there's no concept of what a uh, 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 law of nature is. And then the bells went ringing and uh, we experienced, hey, wait a moment, when we look into how decisions are made in organizations, in politics, the big decisions, they are verified for all sorts of things, methods, uh, laws, uh, latest trends, and so forth. But nobody is asking the question, what laws of nature may apply? And at the end of the day, there are countless decisions that conflict with laws of nature, like tipping point laws of nature in organizations. And it appeared that the higher the uh, value proposition of an innovative solution is, the quicker it gets stuck. It doesn't get through the system anymore. So I was wondering, would this be an idea for your project to include something that gets the laws of nature into the stream into our heads in particular, into the heads of decision maker and the experts in management, social sciences, and so forth. I think that's a brilliant point. And I feel like that's a whole, that's a whole conversation, you know, or session like this one in and of itself. Um, and absolutely, I mean, even you saying that, thinking about the installation at the London Design Biennale, if I can create a stream that helps activate wh exactly what you're talking about, you've... ...touching upon, which is that we typically have a lot of these fields, even within an organization, their different departments are so siloed from one another. They're not communicating. There are often very few bridges. You know, there are really still a lot of these divides. And through the work I do, you know, yes, I'm a musician, but really I feel like for me, it's about making bridges. The, the work is about making bridges between these areas of discipline or understanding fields of, of science um, that are typically not communicating with one another. And often the scientists don't have the ways of communicating that really allow people to be drawn in, you know, as in they might have all the knowledge and all the, the, the sort of expert information, but they won't always know how to communicate that in a fashion that really makes people think, oh, God, yeah, OK, I get it. And so that's where art is a wonderful, almost like this mercurial um, you know, connector between these different areas that often aren't in dialogue with one another. Well, actually, that's the second stream, when you talk, uh, what you talk about, that we identified as well. And there's another one we could talk a, a, about uh, another time. There's actually three streams that uh, may be of uh, enormous value. So... Um, yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. M maybe, maybe you guys can follow up. I believe contact info is on your on your website, bdwolf.com, correct? Then um, if you would like to follow up, please f feel free to reach out. You almost answered my last question, the last question that I had, which is sort of what, what you hope to achieve with your own work. Clearly, clearly you're not just making music out of a, a personal drive, a need, but you um, also want to achieve something for the greater good, at least that's my feeling. Um, then explain a little bit, please, just to wrap it up, where, where you hope to go and, and maybe where the overarching um, kind of goal of all of this is. Uh, 
I think we all, as human beings, have much greater power than we realize. And for me, since I was very small, I was always thinking about what I would leave behind. I was thinking about my funeral and the song I would have at my funeral and all these like morbid things that a five-year-old is thinking about. But really what that was about was I didn't care how, in a way, how this life went in terms of, oh, the stuff I do in the world, will people like it? You know, will they like me? <laughs> I didn't really care about that. I just wanted to make a contribution. I wanted to do something I felt had maybe some value or could help or could leave something. And I think we, we all have that. Um, but I think that for a number of reasons, you know, technology, I spoke at the beginning about it fast tracking, at a time where instant gratification, we, you know, we want instant feedback, instant gratification, rather than thinking a, a hundred, 500, a thousand years, you know, into the future, and really realizing that we're a part of something much bigger. You know, we are the largest ecosystem. We cannot take ourselves apart from the greater whole and be okay. So I feel like my work is really hopefully reminding people of the value of art and nature for our humanity at this point in time when that might, might seem obvious, but I think we've forgotten that art is so much more than entertainment. It is medicine in a lot of cases for us to keep us vital and alive inside. Nature literally sustains and allows us to thrive, um, not just survive. And so, yeah, I, that's what the work is about, reminding people of maybe aspects of life that we might have forgotten about because technology has made us feel very um, good at innovating, but I think we need to reclaim as much as we need to innovate going forward. That was a wonderful way to end the session. Thank you so much for joining us. Apologies um, to both the audience here and, and to you for some audio glitches that we had, unfortunately recurring audio glitches. Um, for me, it was hugely rewarding anyway. I hope um, our audience sees it the same way. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks to you, BT, all the best. Can't wait to uh, hear and see your, what, you, what you're dreaming <laughs> up next. Thank you. It was wonderful to be here. Thank you, Karsten. Vielen Dank. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of Berlin Science Week. Alles Gute. Ciao.